Good morning and welcome to Willow Creek Huntley Online and happy Father's Day to all you dads, granddads, stepdads, brothers, uncles, all you guys. We're so glad you joined us today. And if you're new, text WCH NEW to the number on the screen. We'd love to meet you and get to know you better. And if you want to know about everything that's going on around our church, sign up for E! News. Our lead pastor Todd Catter shares news every week. Speaking of news, WCH Worship has new music. If you haven't had a chance, visit the site on the screen and take a listen. Now today we're going to celebrate our dads, and there's no better way to do that than from hearing from you about why some of your dads are so great. Take a listen. The reason dad is the greatest is because he cares for me, he is kind, and he's the best dad on the world. My dad's the best because he has such a loving and kind heart that I can look up to and has always wanted nothing but the best for me. My dad is the greatest because he plays with us, he helps us when we need help with our homework, and he's also funny. <laughs> dad, thanks for always being someone who will drop everything to help someone. I love Daddy because he sings Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to me. He's a great leader. There was something about him that just drew me to him and I wanted to be with him all the time. My dad is the greatest because he gives me haircuts. One of my favorite things to do with my grandpa Alan is go to Iowa State games and go on tractor rides on the farm. Cause he plays with me. He, he's a good cook and we have fun together. Going camping with him, going to Krispy Kreme, especially going to the bookstore too. I love doing a lot of amazing things with my grandpa. He makes the world's best pancakes. But truly, my dad is the greatest because he always puts our family first. Probably because he's so kind, funny, and I love when we play Tickle Monster. He kisses my face sometimes. <laughs> Seeing my dad find joy even in the darkest of times, how much it helped me grow. My dad is the greatest because he is kind and generous. Because he's always making time for me and doesn't panic when I'm learning to drive. I have my wonderful husband, who is an amazing father to our two boys who are fully grown. Our dad is the greatest because he always makes me laugh and he always gives me the best hugs. Because he cuddles with us. My dad is the greatest because he loves me. He's really nice, he's kind, and he's always there for me. He always takes me on fun adventures and he always makes me feel so special. My dad is the best, he's cutest. You are the best example I could think of for myself and for my daughters, and you're always gonna be my biggest hero. Cause he's funny and kind. He helps people with broken legs, broken arms, brain bleeds, stuff like that. My father, who um, passed away five years ago, my father was so great. And um, one of the things I loved about my dad is that he was so committed to our family. Always made time for us and made things special. He supports me in school and in sports. Also, my dad is an amazing man of God, a great example of what it means to lead a Christian household. Because I love him, he's the best, and blah, blah, blah. I already told you. He cares for the family, he protects the family, and also he works very, very hard for the family. So that's why I love my dad. You're the best dad in the world. So to all the dads of Willow Huntley, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. We love you, Daddy. Daddy. That's the end of our presentation. It's awesome. Well, hello and welcome. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the worship pastors here, and I'm so glad that you're here to join us for Willow Creek Huntley, our online church experience. And today's a special day. Today is Father's Day, and we love and value fathers at Willow Creek Huntley. Uh, so if you're a dad or a granddad, if you're a stepdad, an adoptive dad, I mean, a dad of any kind or a father figure of any kind in someone's life, I want you to know we celebrate you. And uh, today, as we gather together and we celebrate our Father in heaven, let's bring our best praise to Him. So come on, join with me right now. Come on, sing with me.
I feel like my faith has been impacted in this season in a unique way. The climate that we're in right now is tough and it's been really, really hard on me without a doubt. I've had to double down on my faith. It's been tough, right? It's, it's, it's what's been happening lately has been heavy on, on my heart, my, wi my wife's heart. So I have, uh, you know, three beautiful boys. Derek, the oldest, is six. MJ, our middle son, he is four. And then our youngest, Brian, he is two. Lots of fun in the house. My kids are a little bit older, right? My son's 23, just graduated from college last year. My daughter's 20, she just finished her sophomore year in college. So we had been effectively acting as empty nesters until COVID came and our world came crashing down on us. Well, I have three sons and the oldest is 15. And I remember when COVID started, um, I had a conversation with him because it was very evident he doesn't really thrive in the world of the unknown. I can identify with that as a dad because um, I really don't thrive all that well when I don't know what's coming next. So as far as like how I've engaged with them, you know, just see how they're dealing with things, you know, learning from home, um, not being able to see their friends. They're curious, right? Explaining to them like, okay, why can't we uh, hug mommy when she gets home from work? Sometimes I think back to when this all started and wonder if because I live in that place of uncertainty, you know, very uncomfortably, that I might have squandered some of the opportunities because I was just trying to survive through it all. So we've been overly cautious, and I think the kids have been as well. 
Uh, working from home has been a bit of a challenge when there are four different people trying to do four different things in the house. Um, and all of us believe we have the, the right of way, but uh, that's been probably the toughest part of it for us. I think that my perspective as a dad has definitely been shaped by what has occurred in our country. I had never seen somebody killed on TV. So uh, that really hit home, and then I couple that with the fact that George Floyd is the same age as me. But I'm starting to dig in more into history and understand how far we have or have not come since the riots in 68 or since the you know, Civil Rights Act was signed. So it's been a fantastic opportunity as a parent just to kind of uh, put my arms around them uh, teach them what I know and kind of impart that wisdom that I feel they need and that I have learned over the years, both in my own experiences and through that of my parents and grandparents. One of the things that I shared with um, my boys in talking to them with it, about this is how do we just, just love like Christ loves? I think that's, that's the most important thing. Not everybody's the same, but that's the beauty of, of who we are. I just want them to be, be able to just grow up and uh, you know, spread that love towards others, whether it's their friends or whoever they interact with on a daily basis. Being forced to lead my family in a season where I don't know what's coming next has challenged me and really uh, driven me to lean into something bigger. And that's, and that's trusting in God. That's trusting in what His plan is, even though I don't know specifically what that is or what's coming next. I think back to my dad. A few years ago, he retired from work and they had a retirement party at his office. And so we sat through the experience. Uh, they told some good stories about my dad. They laughed and they had cake and we got a chance to mingle with some of his coworkers. And every single one of them that came up to me and introduced themselves to me said, I just love your dad. And that's exactly what I want. Um, people to say about me and I want my kids to know like I put my effort out and did my best in this world hoping one to fit in two to be accepted and loved and three for people to remember me as being one of the good guys. There is no question that this has been such a crazy season to be a dad. And I'm the father of a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And at their ages, they have no clue what's been going on the last few months. They have no clue why their dad has been working from home quite a bit. They have no clue that when I go into the guest bedroom, I can't play cars with them as they roll the cars around on the bed. They have no clue that when I'm on a phone call, I can't pick them up, although sometimes I still try to do that. Um, but most of all, they have no clue how fortunate our family has been how we have had food on our table, how God has protected us, how we have not been the victims of injustice, how we have just seen the unique sense of God's favor. We've been so blessed and honestly, they have no clue and I'm glad they have no clue because God has given us this sense of security in this season. And I was reading a book on this about what are the three elements that help our kids feel secure. And the first one is they need to feel seen. And I've seen this with my boys. In fact, they will run with all their might across our living room, and then they get all the way to the other end of the living room, and they turn around, and they look. Is Daddy watching? You can see when they see my eyes, they're so glad that I see them. I see them in that moment. The next one is they need to feel safe. And when we go on our walks, you know, around our neighborhood, I can see they want to run around, and trust me, it takes some work to make sure that they're safe. And the last one is they need to feel soothed. Because sometimes my boys, and many of us even, can get triggered. And it's the job of every good dad to try to soothe their kids, to try to calm them, to let them know that they're gonna be okay. And I know all of us are imperfect dads, but we're all trying to do that. But graciously, we have a Heavenly Father that even for those of us who have the imperfect dads, we know that we have the perfect, almighty, Heavenly Father. He sees us, he makes us feel safe, he soothes us in our pain, and he declares who we are. He declares that we are his sons and his daughters. And that is the peace and the hope that we rest in in every season, and especially this Father's Day. I
I was lost, but he brought me his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I I invite you now to put yourself in a posture of prayer. Would you close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we thank you that you love us, Lord, and that you loved us first. God, while we were still sinners, the scriptures tell us, Christ died for us. And Lord, you have given us identity and you call us who we truly are, Lord. You call us children of yours. So Lord, thank you for being the, the perfect example of Father. Lord, we know that today, uh, on this Father's Day, that it can be, uh, so for some of us it can be easy. It can be easy to be grateful for our dads and grandfathers and father figures, but for some of us, Lord, it can be really complicated because uh, our earthly dads are flawed. So God, we just, we pray for your comfort, we pray for your help and for your guidance, and Lord, for you to fill up our hearts, Lord, with grace and with understanding, Lord. Uh, and with your comfort as you lead us and guide us as we go forward. So Lord, thank you, thank you for who you are. Thank you for not giving up on us. And Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts to receive instruction from your holy scriptures today and to be encouraged by you as we step forward in faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, welcome everybody. Again, thanks so much for being with us today and a special shout out to all of our dads, our granddads, our stepdads, our great granddads, our father figures of all kinds. Um, thanks for being with us and I hope that you have a happy Father's Day. 
And we know that every dad loves a good dad joke. So I came up with a few especially terrible dad jokes. So here's the first one. Why didn't the melons get married? Because they can't elope. Get it, cantaloupe? I know, it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. All right, here's the next one. What do you call a fake noodle? It's an impasta. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Last one. Um, did, why is milk the fastest liquid on earth? It's past your eyes before you even see it. I know, get it, past your eyes. I know, those are terrible. Those are beyond terrible. You just, thanks for humoring me on Father's Day. Um, but a special shout out to those who are at our park and play at 9 a.m. today. Again, we're gonna have park and play for one more week uh, just at 9 a.m. and then we're gonna take July off and our team is working on our reopening plan. So we'll have more to come on that, but just um, stay tuned. Um, but our food drive has been going super strong. Thank you guys, keep bringing in your boxes, it's making such a difference. In fact, we have a picture here. One small group got together and packed 40 boxes. It's just so cool to see how God is moving. You guys are being so generous. And thanks for how your generosity is impacting our church. In fact, whether you give online or you mail in your checks, it is making such a difference in this season and we are super grateful. So let's pray. God, we thank you for how people are showing up to serve our community through this food drive and other ways. God, we thank you for how people are showing up and just giving and being faithful, helping our church stay strong. And God, we thank you for dads. We pray that they will feel especially honored and loved and celebrate on this Father's Day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Tuesday, we had a really great conversation on some next steps about racial injustice. And I'm just really grateful for how we have a team that's coming together on this. And if you'd like to be a part of that, just uh, email Shannon and let us know. We're gonna continue to walk on this journey together. But today, we have a fantastic Father's Day message from Albert Tate. Some of you heard the great conversation that he had with our senior pastor, Dave Dummett, about race and injustice. But now he has a great Father's Day message for us. So let's check it out. Hey, Willow family, I am so excited to uh, continue in this great series. Um, I'm so excited. Pastor Dave, last week, he did such a phenomenal job uh, walking through this passage with Elijah. We're coming back to that same passage um, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 19. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to start reading around verse 3, uh, but, but I, first I just want to make a couple of comments. So thankful for Pastor Dave, um, and he was so gracious to offer up my phone number last week. And I, I thought about, man, how could I thank him uh, so much for inviting everyone to call me? And I just know his heart uh, already there, new in the city. He would just love for people just to spontaneously stop by his home. Um, I know he would appreciate people just coming over. Um, and he feels love when you come over at odd times of the day because it lets you know that you really, really care and that you really, really need him. So we're gonna put his home address here in, in the feed, put it in right there. And would you just feel the freedom to go by um, and say hi and drop random things off on his front porch and ring the doorbell and, and just leave? because uh, he, just, he just wants to hear the doorbell ring and then just run away um, uh, or, or bring people over. Um, th I think that'll, be, that'll bless his life. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know. No, that's, that's not his real address. Don't go there. That could, it could, something really bad could happen. Uh, but let, let's go to the Word of God. First Kings, First Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Here it is. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judea, in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this word. We pray that you would speak to us like only you can. Would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly? Would you turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us? God, it's to that end that I ask that you would stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Uh, uh, in this series, uh, we, we want to encourage you to kind of get out of your mind a little bit uh, with the weight and the worry and the burden of everything that's going on with the pandemic, the social uprising of the injustice that we're seeing literally on our screens. We're seeing it in real time. In the midst of that, we want to make sure that you're taking care of your soul. As we, as we stay safe and fight for healthy families, we want you to stay for, care for your soul. As we fight against injustice and as we stand in opposition against racism, we want you to take care of your soul. Uh, we find here, I mean, to be honest, Elijah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't pick the series. I'm new to the teaching pastor role, so I, I, I hadn't weighed in yet. This is probably going to be one of the most depressing, discouraging series you've ever had in your life. I mean, just read that. Like, he, it ended up with him going to sleep up under a tree and saying, I want to die. Who picked this? Dave, is this how you really want to start? You want to start the series with us stressed out and land up under trees? <laughs> you know what? To be honest, I think this is the best way for us to start. You know why? Because this is our reality. And, and sometimes we have a hard time talking about having a hard time. Sometimes we have a hard time as believers and in Christian spaces, we have a hard time talking about when we're discouraged. Have a hard time talking about when we're overwhelmed. We, 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 we act as if mourning and hope can't live together, but it really can't. So I appreciate our ability to sit in text like this and talk about when we are mentally overwhelmed, when our minds are overwhelmed and exhausted and tired and unhealthy, when we navigate imbalance. Where's my faith when I'm in depression? Where's my faith when I'm sad? Where's my faith in the midst of discouragement? So I'm actually excited to talk about this subject because we don't talk about it enough. And there's a slight shame. There's a, there's a shame that goes with sadness, with discouragement, with depression. There's, there's, a, there's this kind of a shaming and a guilt because I feel bad because as a Christian, I'm supposed to always be hopeful, but you can be sad and hopeful at the same time. You can be discouraged and hopeful at the same time. We see it over and over again, but you just need to know overwhelmingly from your leaders here that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. Elijah was not okay. You can tell from the text, he wondered if his life even mattered. He wondered if his life had worth. For the next few moments, I just want to talk a little bit about how do you find worth when you feel like your life is worthless? You hear his confession. He said, it'll be easier for me to die than to try to overcome this. And Pastor Dave talked about those suicidal thoughts. And if, if that's anywhere near your mind, I want you to tell you, don't you hesitate one second to reach out for help. Don't you hesitate one second to reach out and call us and to signal someone you love or even the pastoral team here at the church. We gladly stand with you. Our counseling ministry would gladly stand with you. Don't allow those thoughts just to orbit around unchecked. Elijah was in that moment. I, I just want to give you three tips, three ways to find worth when you feel like your, worth, your, your, your life is worthless. Three ways to find worth when you feel like your life is worthless. Number one, you find worth in community. You find worth in community. Elijah, he did it. He missed it. He missed an opportunity. Look at it with me. Verse, verse four, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He left his servants while he himself went into a day's journey in the wilderness. Listen, you don't, if you don't go through the wilderness, you, you don't go by yourself. If you're going to go through the wilderness, don't you go by yourself. When you are feeling overwhelmed and discouraged, now's not the time to opt into isolation. Now's not the time to go and I just need a bunch of alone time. I get needing to be by yourself. Listen, I, I used to think I was an extrovert until I got quarantined with my family. I am an introvert. I'm telling you, I have been converted by corona. I, so I get the value of just self-quiet time, but no, he went on a journey in the wilderness by himself. 
Worst thing you can do is go for a long time in isolation and not invite people to sit with you in what you're sitting in. Worst thing you can do is go through a long journey and not invite people to sit with you in what you're sitting in. Invite people to sit with you. Invite people to sit with you. Now, can I just give you some tips on how to invite people to sit with you and to sit with you in a way that's healthy? Uh, Sit with you, don't rush you, and don't fix you. The temptation sometimes is, sometimes, and I feel this, I feel this. When I'm sitting with a friend that's going through a hard time, I have a tendency to want to try to rush them through the process, to try to get them to feel better quickly. My job when I'm sitting with someone that's going through a hard time, my job isn't to try to get them to feel better. My job is just to be with them. Get people and just tell them, hey, I don't need you to fix me. I don't need you to get me to feel better. I just need you to be with me. Come on, can we be honest? Sometimes we want them to hurry up and feel better because we ourselves don't like the discomfort of sitting with someone that's going through something hard. So we don't want them to rush through it so that they can be better. We want them to rush through it so that we can be comfortable. Because it's uncomfortable sitting with somebody that's going through a hard time. And it's hard just to listen and to be. If you don't believe me, ask Job's friends. They listened for a while, but then they started talking. And oh, Lord, the whole thing just got worse when they started talking. Know how to sit with people. If you're going to go through the wilderness, find worth by having people with you that can see you, that can support you, that can encourage you right where you are. My job ain't to fix you in this season. My job is to be with you and to encourage you. One of my favorite, favorite, um, favorite uh, Broadway shows is um, Hamilton. Gotta be in the room when it happens, the room when it happens, the room when it happens. Gotta be in the room when it happens. I love that. I love that. Because being in the room matters. You need some people that can be in the room with you when it happens. But let me tell you something. Jesus would tell you, Jairus' daughter, when she, passed, when, she, when she died and they thought she was dead and they, they, they were soon discovered that she was just asleep. Remember when, when Jesus and Jairus finally got to the house? They got to the house. Everybody thought she was dead. They were mourning her death. And Jesus says, why are you crying? She is not dead. She is just asleep. And they laughed Jesus out of the room. They just laughed. And Jesus kicked everybody out the room. He said, everybody out. And he only took in Jairus, mom, and the people that came with Jesus. Because everybody can't be in the room where it happens. Some rooms, you just need people that can believe God with you. Some rooms, you just need people that are just going to have faith with you. Some rooms, you just need your prayer warriors. They need to be in the room where it's happening. Don't go through the wilderness by yourself. Elijah! Don't go by yourself because it's in community where people can believe God with you, can pray with you, can sit with you. It is there where you can find worth when you feel like your life is worthless. The next thing, next thing we see, watch this, uh, verse 4. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough. Lord, he said. He sat down under the broom bush and prayed that he might die. When you're looking for worth, you need to be real careful with where you sit. Elijah, I would encourage you, don't just sit under the broom bush. Sit under the presence of God. Sit in the presence of God. Now ain't the time just to sit in yourself, to sit in your feelings, to sit in your thoughts. All those things are great. Sit in all those things. Those are beautiful. I'm not encouraging anybody to be in denial, in an unhealthy denial. No, 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 no. Sit in your feelings, sit in your thoughts, sit in your mind. But in the midst of that, invite God's presence in that and say, Lord, in the midst of that, I'm going to sit in your presence. And you'll soon discover when you sit in his presence, God's got a way of getting you out of your feelings, getting you out of your mind, and getting you out of the weightiness of the situation. Because in his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, you'll find hope. In his presence, you will find peace. So as you're sitting there, uh, here's a question I want to ask. Where are you sitting? 
Where are you sitting? Are you just sitting in your thoughts? Are you just sitting in your feelings? Are you just sitting in bitterness? Are you sitting in unforgiveness? Are you sitting in anger? Are you sitting in frustration? Are you sitting in his presence? And, and, and here's the thing. Bring anger. Bring frustration. Bring all of that in his presence. So to, to, to sit in one is not to negate the other. No, to sit in one is to surrender the other. Sit in one is to invite God into the other. So bring all of that in there. But just know that in the presence of God, as you get in his presence, he ain't just coming to hang out. He's coming to transform you. If you're incurred, if you're discouraged, if you're feeling worthless, you'll find worth in his presence. Because it is in his presence that he tells you who you are. He reminds you of who you are in his presence. That's why you got to get in his presence because all the lies of the world will just be radiating around you and just be illuminating around you. You'll see, you hear it, and you're sitting under the, uh, under the broom bush, but you're not sitting under the shelter of the Almighty God. Sit in his presence because his presence won't lead you to desire death. His presence will lead you to pursue life. I know you're sitting in hard times. I know you're sitting in some difficult situations. I know you're sitting in places of struggle. But are you sitting in his presence? Have you invited the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to sit right there where you are? Because as he's in his presence, as you're in his presence, he's going to tell you who you are. He's going to remind you of who you are. I think of Exodus. I think of when the children of Israel came out of the, 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 the tyranny, the regime of, 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 of Pharaoh. Um, they, were, they were slaves. And they would work from sunup to sundown all day, every day. And that was their life as a slave. They would work as a slave all day, every day. God calls them out. And although they call him to the, although they go to the wilderness, Exodus 16, they go to the wilderness, but God provides for them in the wilderness. And he does something very interesting. He says, I'm going to provide manna in the morning, meat at night, and I'm going to do it for six days. But on the seventh day, I'm not, I'm I'm not going to provide anything. I'm going to give you double on the sixth day. So that way on the seventh day, you can rest. Why was that such a big deal to God? Because on that seven day, I need you to rest because it is in your resting in my presence that I remind you of who you are, that I remind you, here it is, that you're not a slave anymore. Pharaoh had you working every day of the week, and I need to break that rhythm. I need to break that slave rhythm out of your life so every seventh day you are going to rest so that you will know you are no longer under the regime of Egypt and Pharaoh. You are under the kingdom of the Lord God Almighty. I need you to rest so that I might remind you of who you are, and who you are is not a slave. Who you are is a son. Who you are, you're a daughter. You are the beloved of God. I need to remind you of who you are, so you need to rest. Get in my presence so I can remind you you're not a slave anymore. Elijah, don't just sit under the broom bush. Sit under the presence of the almighty God so he can shout your worth. He can tell you you're not a slave to discouragement. You're not a slave to sadness. You're not a slave to the, to, to the enemies, to fear. You're not a slave. You are a son a beloved son, get in his presence so that you might find worth because in his presence he tells you who you are. You want to find worth. If you want to look for worth, look in community. Number two, look in his presence. Sit in his presence. Thirdly, finally, if you want to find worth, if you want to find worth, Verse 4, he says, I have had enough, Lord. He said, watch this, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. He says, I've had enough. He says, take my life. He says, because I want to die. I want to die. He says, I've had enough. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I want to die. 
Elijah makes a confession. He says, I've had enough. I like this part, Elijah. I can go with you here. I can go with you here. Because sometimes I don't think we do this enough at church. I don't think we tell, we, we always, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. If I got into happier, I couldn't stand it. Shut up, just lying? Sometimes we just lie. We don't, you cried yourself to sleep last night. Come on, tell the truth. You don't feel great today. You feel terrible. But see, we've just got a habit of just not confessing the truth. Elijah says, I'm not playing. I'm not trying to make up no So I'm telling you, I have had enough, Lord. Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever been so overwhelmed with the reality of the world that you said, God, I've had enough? Have you ever been so frustrated, so overwhelmed with the weight of the world, with the crisis of the day, that you say, Lord, I've had enough? It's okay to look up to heaven and say, Lord, I've had enough. It's okay to be overwhelmed and say, Lord, I have enough. It's okay not to be okay. Believer, man of God, woman of God, you're still a woman of faith. You're still a man of faith, but you can tell the truth and say, I've had enough. Confess. He says, I've had enough. But here's the deal, Elijah. Here's, here's point number three. You can make the confession, but you don't get to draw the conclusion. You can make the confession, but you don't get to draw the conclusion. He says, I have enough. And then he says, so I've decided, Lord, take my life. I've drawn the conclusion. I know how this ends. No, you don't get to say how it ends. You get to tell the truth about how you feel, but you don't get to say how it ends. The sovereign God Almighty gets to dictate the ending of this story. You don't get to write it. You don't get to get tired and to throw in the towel and say, I quit. No, you don't get to quit on God. God didn't quit on you, so you don't get to quit on him. You can make the confession, but you don't get to draw the conclusion because you will soon discover you can find your worth in the confession. You can find your worth in confession. Confession literally means it's not just the idea of saying all the bad stuff I did. No, 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 no. Confession is, is it, it literally translates, it's the idea of saying what he says. So I confess what he says. I confess what God declares. So I confess about me what God says about me. So I confess. So that, that's, that's, that's the sin in my life. Yes, God says that's sin. I agree. That's it. But to confess with God is to agree with God. It's to agree with God. And you can find your worth while agreeing with God. In your agreement with God, if you start agreeing with God, make your confession. Don't draw the conclusion. You don't get to dictate how it ends, but you can make the confession. And the confession is, I'm going to agree with God. So whatever God says about me, I'm going to agree with that. It's kind of like this idea. Growing up in Mississippi, we used to love to play this, this game. It's universal all around the world. It's called Simon Says. Simon Says. Now, now, the thing is, Simon was authoritarian. And whatever Simon said, you had to do exactly what Simon said. Simon Says go right, you better go right. Simon said, go left, you go left. Simon Says bunny hop, you better start hopping. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. If Simon didn't say it, you better not do it. Uh, so they'll try to get you. Simon said, go right, go right. Simon said, go left, go left, go left, go left. And if you go, oh, you out. You didn't do what Simon says. That's confession. Every day of my life, I'm going to do what, not what Simon says, because I don't know who Simon is, but I'm going to do what Jesus says. Jesus says, take a step forward. I'm going to take a step forward. Jesus says, go to the right. I'm going to go to the right. Jesus says, go to the left. Jesus, I'm going to go to the left. Jesus says, believe me, I'm good and I'm God. I'm going to believe you, God, because you're good. Jesus says, my life has meaning. So Jesus, I'm going to believe what you said. Jesus says, my life is worth living. So Jesus, I'm going to believe what you said. Jesus says, you should have hope. You should lift up your head. So Jesus, I'm going to lift up my head. Jesus says that no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. Jesus says, greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. Jesus says, I am the I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And if Jesus said it, I'm doing it. I'm going to do what Jesus says. And you will find your worth in what Jesus says because Jesus says you're the head and not the tail. You will be above and not beneath. Jesus says you are his beloved son and daughter. So I'm going to walk in. I'm going to believe in. I'm going to stay in what Jesus said. Come on, church. Let's play Jesus says this week. Let's play Jesus says so that we might find our worth and we don't live our lives feeling as though it is worthless. Because we found worth in community. We found worth in his presence 
and we found worth in our confession because we agree with what he said. At the end of the passage, he goes to sleep. But he goes to sleep frustrated and overwhelmed. Some of you know what that's like to go to sleep frustrated and overwhelmed. I encourage you, get in his presence so that he might get you out of your mind and get your mind in his mind. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Because in his mind, as we rest in who he is, he says, come on unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can sleep, but more than sleep, Elijah, in the presence of God, you can rest. You can rest for his glory. Amen. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray that in their sleeping that they'd find themselves resting. Resting in a community that can point them to God, point them to you, Jesus. Resting in your presence, knowing that in your presence there is fullness of joy, there's healing, there's hope, there's deliverance. But in your presence, there's also an invitation to bring anger, bring sadness, bring depression, bring discouragement. But that they can rest in your presence and they can rest in their confession as we all seek to agree, Father, with what you said and what you say about us. So may we find our worth in your presence, in your word, in our community. And may we rest in what you said about our worth and who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Willow. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Again, that's my prayer, that you would rest in the worth that God says about you. And if you'd like to take a next step with a group or a team, just let us know. You can email us or you can get a new Bible if you're new. We'd love to help you on your journey. Hope you have a great Father's Day. God bless. Try